everyone. I'm Melissa McAllister, and you're listening to The Melissa Made Show. Now, for decades, I've dedicated myself to helping women break the cycle of dieting, navigate through all the fads, and change their lives through my nutrition coaching. Now, each week, I'm going to talk about everything from deep nutrition, mindset, self-care, the ideal workout routine, tips on how and why to implement intermittent fasting in your life, my favorite recipes that are not only crowd pleasers, but they're actually healthy for you, and so much more. Now with small and consistent changes, you can defy aging while living a happier, healthier, and more heart-filled life. I'm so excited to show you it's possible with the right strategies that are so simple to adopt. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Melissa Made podcast. So I want to introduce you today to my guests. Yes, I said guests. So for me, this is the very first time that I have uh, two ladies on the podcast. So this is going to be fun for me. So the first guest that I have is Jess Sukan. She's a board certified holistic health and hormone coach and her mom, Candice Birch with her master's of arts. She's a hormone health educator with 30 plus years in the field, as well as extensive podcast and public speaking experience. Now, these two ladies, um, um, they have a family owned business, a woman centered business, and they're going to dive deeper with us into how our hormones are everything we do and how we show up in this world. We're going to touch on hormone rebalancing techniques for improved menstrual cycles, performance in and out of the gym. We're going to talk about skin. We might talk about libido, sleep, mood, and a smooth transition into menopause and a sustainable weight loss, among many other things. Now, this dynamic duo, uh, uh, you're going to really enjoy them. And uh, Jess and I were having great conversations about our mothers uh, (laughs) before before Miss Candice jumped on. (laughs) And I was just telling them too, on Wednesday, I I recorded a uh, with JJ Virgin. And we talked about her being a mom. And about two weeks ago, um, I interviewed my own mother for this podcast. And, you know, of course I'm biased and I think my mother is the greatest on earth. And so I am sure Jess feels the same way. So I would love to open this podcast, Jess, with you having the opportunity to brag on your mom. Oh, Yeah, And that's so special that you had your mom on the podcast. I think that's really, really wonderful. And thank you for having us on. We are really excited. Um, I, yeah, there's so many things to brag about my mom. Um, We grew up in a very healthy household. We grew up actually in London, England. My parents are both from the U S but they were living over there for a time. And we grew up, I always say we grew up drinking, you know, almond milk before it was cool and (laughs) made buckwheat pancakes on the weekends for our treat. And we weren't really allowed to watch too much TV. We did watch movies and cartoons on the weekend, but we did family plays. We played outside. We were really active and just a very creative family. My dad's a photographer, so he's very creative. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom has always, both of them have always helped us to cultivate just really healthy eating habits, but not in a restrictive feeling way. Mm -hmm. And so we grew up with these really healthy habits instilled, but, um, as I got older, I sort of rebelled once I got to high school and I started doing my own thing and, uh, eating off campus lunches with friends, going to Taco Bell, going to Starbucks, getting the Frappuccinos, Um, I was really active the first half of high school. I was on swim team, never really had to think about my weight, but once I quit sports and I kept eating this way with friends, I gained about 35 pounds very quickly. It felt like it was overnight and I have always been kind of a private person. So I felt like I was hiding it, but Mm -hmm. My mom, and we can talk about this a little bit more if you want, we talked about it recently on a podcast, but my mom kind of approached me with, you know, you've gained some weight in a short period of time. And I'm a little bit worried about you. And uh, I think the way that she approached me maybe wasn't the most helpful at the time. And I, 
uh, I already knew that it was happening. I already felt really self-conscious about it, but I thought maybe no one noticed because I just started wearing more layers and trying to hide it. And I, you know, at, eventually ended up just taking matters into my own hands, not really going to my mom and talking to her about it, even though she would have been supportive. Mm -hmm. I kind of went on to start yo-yo dieting. I started taking diet pills and then I tried Atkins and South beach and all these different fad diets. And then later on keto, when it became popular and, you know, gained and lost upwards of 45 pounds multiple times in my life. And my mom has always been very open with us. She's always said that if we want to talk to her about anything, she's there for us, very mm -hmm. supportive, loving household. And it wasn't until I started experiencing all of these hormonal imbalances that I decided to return home to my mom and ask her for help. Mm -hmm. And she really helped me to rebalance my hormones naturally by helping me to test my hormones, get to the root of imbalances. She helped me to learn how to have better balance with my nutrition and really learn what supplements to introduce in to help me. Um, you know, there was just a lot of support. And I feel like in those years, we grew a lot closer because I really needed her help and her advice. And I was actually ready to get help. Whereas I wasn't before. Mm -hmm. And in that process, I was able to rebalance my hormones. I was able to get back a natural period, which I had lost for about four years through restriction. Um, and I just felt so much better that I eventually wanted to help other women do the same thing. So I quit my corporate job at the time and decided to become a holistic health coach and was actually able to eventually join forces with my mom and my sister to start this family business where we have now tested thousands of people's hormones and helped them to rebalance naturally. But I honestly, I wouldn't be doing this work if it wasn't without my mom and her support and her knowledge and her guidance. So I'm really grateful to her for, because met for many years, my sister and I rolled our eyes at her when she would talk about hormones and we acted very impatient and we just didn't want to hear it. And now it's all we talk about. We actually have to create boundaries, especially when we're with my dad, because he doesn't want to hear about hormones all day. And now we all are obsessed about talking about it. I love that. And it's funny you say that, um, because my daughter had, you know, she's lost. It's funny about, I mean, I'm be closer to 60 pounds now, but about 45 pounds, but there for a while she's carrying that, that extra weight. And she kept coming to me, you know, she grew up with me being, uh, in the fitness and nutrition world, uh, kept coming to me and telling me I'm doing everything. I'm trying really, really hard. And I remember we were actually on a mother daughter trip and she was doing the same and we had just gotten done working out and she was telling me how hard she was trying and I had to, and it was really hard. Uh, and Candace, I can imagine how hard it was for you. It was really hard for me to tell her, no, <laughs> actually <laughs> you're not because when she would do her workouts, there was a very half-ass effort. She wasn't she maybe wasn't enjoying what she was doing or for whatever reason, but, but the effort wasn't there. And I had to tell her it to get the weight off there. There has to be more effort put in. I know you feel like you're doing everything, but from the outside in looking, you're not doing quite everything. And she was crying and it was terrible, but it was quite pivotal moment for her, um, to get that outer reflection because her self-reflection was I'm doing everything, you know, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, but for someone that loves her deeply, and can see that she mm. wasn't, there was, there was something there. Yeah. Um, it was hard. Yeah, it is hard. So, Candace, it's your turn. Uh, you obviously, you know, I, I, I stalked you guys and you have raised two exceptional daughters. Um, <laughs> can you, uh, you can brag on them a little bit. Yeah. But can you uh, just share with me any secrets that you have for all the moms out there that have daughters um, anything that you and your husband did as parents to help raise such, uh, wonderful, beautiful, successful women. Oh, wow. Well, gosh, I, I could be in floods of tears right now from what Jess said. And she made it sound very nice when I told her that I thought she'd, I was trying to raise the awareness about her gaining weight quickly. That was my thing that she'd gained it in a short amount of time. And I wasn't quite so graceful about it, but I do think, um, being a sociology major in college before I got my master's in health education, 
Um, I learned that the, the famous book, Growing Up Absurd, where he, Paul Goodman talks about your children have to rebel against you. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they have to, to become themselves, to become individuals. They have to sort of reject what mom and dad are inculcating every day. So I, I think it was absolutely normal for Jesse to go, Jess and Ryan to do that. Although every time we talk about this, I learn more stuff. Like I didn't know you were on diet pills, Jess. <laughs> okay. So I learned something new every time. <laughs> Holy <laughs> mackerel. But Not for too long, but that was one of the things I tried. You saved your <laughs> lunch money. I, I read that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, this is so, so interesting. <laughs> but you know, I think what what works probably for us all is that any what however it goes, however it's gone down, it's always been okay because I feel like they are deeply loved. They know they're de my kids have known just as your daughter knows that they're deeply loved. I mean, you know, who else? Who you have to risk? You have to be brave enough and love someone enough to be able to risk their wrath. You have to be able to say what's true. And if you're not forthcoming with your children and your family, who can you be honest mm -hmm. and upfront with? And I think that has helped. I'm, I maybe I'm too blunt and honest, but I, I think the transparency that's always been in our family has helped. I think the girls grew up in a centered way. I have to give some credit to the fact that they spent their formative years in England, because in England, the old world has certain habits and ways of being that are very grounding, like, you know, not in those days, and I'm happy to have raised kids before the advent of cell phones. And I, I God help moms who have to Amen. deal with that. And and I my advice there is freedom within boundaries. Create the boundaries and then allow freedom within that. But you have, you know, again, risking their wrath, you have to help them help themselves because these things are just too addictive. Mm -hmm. But and we and I did that in a certain way with the girls. We did that with television. We could watch this much this often. I did that with uh, England has a when we were living here back then, it was sweet day was on Fridays. So all the kids at school would rush to the news agent and buy whatever crap candy they wanted to eat. But it was only on Fridays. Yeah. So I girls do that, but it really rained them in. They, I don't think you two have ever had a sweet tooth or been really addicted to sugars um, because of those sort of habits. And I also being in the health field was, you know, I was making mashed lentils. And but so I do think there was, uh, and also in England um, and over here in Europe, they don't allow hormones in the food. Mm. So there was no hormone injected dairy or meat. We weren't eat, eating much of of that, but you know, as Jesse was saying, nut milks and um, I was using all those things well before people. Also, homeopathy is big over here. So natural remedies, I really got into, and I could proudly say neither of the girls had been on an antibiotic um, until I think you were of college age. You might have taken one or two. I don't know how often you've been on an antibiotic since then, but all through their childhood and growing up years, we managed things with homeopathy. So I think just a combination of, you know, a close, open-minded, honest family, doing creative things together, playing games, doing puppet shows. I remember you two created your own puppets and presented us with shows and we would act out Jack and the Beanstalk. We read books aloud, mm -hmm. you know, all those things that really bring you close. And then when we moved back to the States, we lived in a very small house with one bathroom for the longest time. And if that doesn't make you a close family, I don't know what does. <laughs> Poor husband, Walt Wall, women and hormones, but we made a lot of fights, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, you know, that's such parallel lives because we raised our children in Hawaii, which is, I think, very similar. There was, I never, and I've done podcasts where I talk about parenting advice. They, they, I never had uh, TVs in, in our cars. Uh, I didn't want them watching TV when we drove, look out the window. Um, they never were allowed to have yeah. TVs in the room. They were to, you know, we went, we lived on the beach. Of course, we lived in Hawaii. So there was so much nature um, that, That's great. and I, and I, I think I raised some pretty damn good kids too. So <laughs> there is something to be said to really mm -hmm. that, that having, having those boundaries. I, I really appreciate hearing that. And I'm going to jump Jess back to you. You gave a little bit about your, uh, your journey for weight loss. And I saw that you had, you know, you had shared about the HCG diet and that you, you know, had you and your friend had saved money to, 
uh, purchase diet pills. And uh, I, you know, I think we've, we all have done that. I, I mean, I cannot remember specifically, but I remember Dexatrim growing up and how that was just, you know, going to make everybody look model thin. Um, what was it, you know, you, you kind of touched on, you know, going back to your mom and hormones and stuff, but can you be a little more specific for the audience? What was it that, that took you from, you know, trying all of the things to actually finding the thing that has helped you get that weight off and keep it off? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I yo-yoed for 12 years, so it was a very long time. It started at the end of high school. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me was I didn't realize back then that restriction long-term will never work (laughs) long-term. So for a sustainable weight loss, I just always felt like unless I was restricting, there would be no way that I could ever lose weight. And what I realized now was that the reason why, you know, I would lose weight, you know, I would drop 20 pounds or I would drop 30 pounds. For example, the HCG diet, where you're injecting yourself with this pregnancy hormone for 30 days and you're eating a 500 calorie diet. And they tell you that, you know, this pregnancy hormone keeps you from being hungry, but yet the first two days of the diet, you're supposed to gorge yourself with high fat foods and eat. Yeah. The first two days is like a loading phase where you gorge for two days on high fat, high calorie foods to hopefully make it so that once you actually go into the 500 calorie phase for 30 days, that you have enough fat restore reserves built up so that you won't be as hungry. It's so unhealthy. And, um, just doing things like that, where it's like, yes, you drop the weight quickly, but then as soon as you start eating normally again, it comes back on with a vengeance. And so I was always in the highs and lows of a cheat day. Mm -hmm. I lived my life looking forward to cheat meals and, I just could never really be present. I was always thinking about food. I was always thinking about my weight. I was always comparing myself to what other people could eat. Uh, That's one of the biggest things I say now to clients is try not to compare your plate to the person next to you. Everybody has a unique body, a unique set of circumstances, unique health history, hormones, like one person's food is another person's poison. We can't compare ourselves to what every, the person next to us is doing, or even, you know, the expert influencer on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so I really had to work on my mindset. I was very addicted to the scale and numbers, whether it was the number on the scale, the number of my pants, whatever it was. And I was just very in my head and it impacted my self-worth. And so it wasn't until I think this happens for a lot of people, you hit rock bottom and you decide enough is enough. And my rock bottom was getting these debilitating migraine headaches that basically sent me to the emergency room. I couldn't work um, for days at a time because I was projectile vomiting in a dark room. I mean, it got really, really bad. And on top of it, I didn't have a period. I had very low energy levels. I had no libido. um, And I really was not able to lose weight anymore. And so I, the breaking point was the migraines. And that's when I went back to my mom and I'm not going to say it happened overnight. And that's why I think when people make a lifestyle change or they start a diet, it's really important to extend the timeline, to give yourself time, not even six months for it. When it takes years to get out of balance, it takes years to, you know, screw with your mental health. And so you have to give yourself enough time to, formulate new habits that are actually going to last and to get to the root of these imbalances and take these steps to change your habits. You have to change the way that you think about nutrition. You have to change the way that you think about exercise and how you fuel your body from the inside out, self-care, the relationship with your body. So I honestly went on years long journey after that point, I was 30 at the time when I turned to my mom and asked for her help. And in rebalancing my hormones, I was able to get a natural cycle back within eight months. I was able to start to see huge improvements and I was able to start losing weight in a more sustainable way. But it took me a few years after that to really also repair my relationship with food. I went through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition course to become a health coach, but even doing that, I had some issues. Like I went vegan for six months because I wanted to try it out because I learned about it in school and that created some disordered eating tendencies. And, you know, I tried all these different things and it wasn't until honestly, 
probably about four years ago, five years ago, that I really felt like I made major progress. And the biggest things that I did was not having a dogmatic approach and not being so black and white about things. It was reintroducing carbohydrates back that were a fear food of mine, slowly and gradually learning how to balance my blood sugar. How do you pair proteins with fats and carbs, learning how to strength train because that I was so addicted to high intensity cardio, which was stressing my body out, how to reduce all that cardio strength train and bring in movement that I loved and yeah. how to really nurture the relationship with myself and others set boundaries. Like my mom was talking about, and it wasn't one thing. It wasn't a quick fix. And I think that we're always looking for that quick fix or the magic pill or whatever it is. But I think it really is just more of a balanced approach. And I know that's not an answer necessarily, but, um, that is truly what has worked for me. And also learning about macros and portion sizes and, um, you know, that kind of thing has, has helped a lot. And I would say you've maintained your weight for quite some years now. Yeah. I've maintained the 45 pound weight loss for six years now. Yeah. Yeah. And and the parallel, the parallels, I I really feel like I should have my daughter, uh, on she's a nutritionist. And like I said, she had lost weight too. And what, how you explained what you just, the, almost the epiphany that you had, cause she was, she was vegan for a very long time, tried that and did not work for her either. And uh, took the, the, I have to do it this way. Or even this morning on my stories, I talked about how everybody feels like, because something is trending that it's the diet they're supposed to be on. And that's not necessarily true. You, you are such an individual and what your needs and what your wants are and, and how you choose to live your life is going to be so individual that you can't say, okay, well, everybody's high protein or everybody's vegan or everybody's, you know, doing s- carnivore, whatever it is you have. I mean, there's nothing wrong with trying it. You can try, you know, but if it doesn't feel like it fits right, you didn't fail. It's just not the right diet for you. Same with exercise. You know, some people are going to love to run. Some people are going to love to do yoga. Some people are going to love to strength train. And just because your friend who lost a bunch of weight decided to become, you know, a runner doesn't mean that you have to, if you don't love running. So, um, I, what I know you said, I don't know if this, that was a straightforward answer. It's, it's reassurance for me because your story is exactly like my daughter's and she's been able to maintain this weight loss same several, several years. And she struggled for so long and she tried everything. So, um, I wish your daughter was here now too. That actually would be awesome. Yeah. 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 (laughs) That wouldn't be great. So Candace, I, you, um, you have been in this space for a very long time and, uh, been a hormone expert for a very long time. Things have, (sighs) Hormones haven't changed by any means, but the way that we, um, the modern conveniences, modern food, things have changed. Our surroundings have changed. And so obviously, uh, female hormones have changed, uh, you know, birth control is, you know, used, um, off brand for so many other things besides not getting pregnant and the hormones that are in foods and we've got, you know, endocrine disruptors. We've just, so can you share with the audience a little bit, your journey of, you know, starting off this love of, of helping women with hormonal health and how you, how it was compared to how it is today and what women can do today to combat all of the things just coming at them at all different angles to, to live a happy and healthy life. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me speak in yes, a here. But, 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 you know, this all started because I had my kids late. I was 38 or 37 when I had Jess. So, uh, and I was 41 when I had Ryan. Mm. So I turned 50 the day Jesse got her period. If that tells you anything. I mean, it's kind of, you know, so we are, we are talking about mother in perimenopause when Mm -hmm. daughter is still quite young, I think, um, you know, and I, we always tell the story about how I was scaring my children because I was, because my moods were just legion legend up and down. There are stories of me, you know, flouncing out of a restaurant, uh, slamming my drink on the table and leaving because they rolled their other uh, girls rolled their eyes at me <laughs> just, it was like out of the box you know everybody freezing in the house but mother's having a hot flash so the windows have to be open in the middle of winter and 
<laughs> I mean, I was just kind of monstrous for a while and I couldn't get my, you know, my moods under control. I was also a journalist for a long time, wrote a lot of health articles for magazines and worked that way in England. And I used to live on deadlines. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you're a journalist, you've got to get that thing in. And when I had kids, I would stay up all night and then I would drink way too much coffee on an empty stomach. So I was really, you know, um, sort of Jekyll and Hyde. And there was that day that Ryan looked at me with the, her tears in her eyes and I realized, okay, I my daughters don't even recognize me. So that is what propelled me to take my master's in health ed and start to specialize in hormone issues. I knew it was hormones for me. And I reached out to uh, Dr. John Lee, who wrote one of the first books about hormone balance. He kind of defined the the concept of, hey, you know, we, there are such, such a thing as hormonal imbalances and they come with symptoms and symptom awareness needs to start to become something that women um, can embrace and say, oh, if I have heavy, painful periods, that's not necessarily normal just because my mother had them or my aunt or my neighbor or the lady in the supermarket has them you know, being in a, I remember being in college and some of my, um, my roommates would be in a fetal ball whenever they got their period. And we'd all run off to the, you know, frat parties thinking poor Natalie, you know, there she is under the table. And we just mm -hmm. all thought that was, it's that, you know, not, not realizing that those sorts of things, um, taking birth control is a default when you're not even using it for contraception. There's 52% of women that are using it because they have acne or heavy irregular periods or migraines, you know, these are, um, and, and they're just getting a wallop of synthetic hormones. So these issues are, they need to become more front and center. And they have been in the, in the 25 or so 30 years I've been doing this. What I ended up doing was reaching out to John Lee, the author, he, he kind of referred me to um, Dr. David Zava, who's a biochemist, cancer research cancer research scientist who had opened a, a saliva testing lab, testing hormones, which had been, saliva had been used within the province of scientists and biochemists, but it hadn't been used in the commercial market for testing hormones. It had been used for DNA and other kinds of testing. But Dr. Zava opened it up to women. He put out, you know, he hired me on the spot. I found him, I walked in, he said, I was looking for someone that that was over 50 and had a hot flash and knew what a hot flash was, but I didn't know how to advertise for that. So, so I mean, I promptly had a hot flash when I was having my interview with him and he hired me and I was with him for 12 years. And that was during the time when um, there was an explosion of of in, interest in natural hormone approaches when there were people starting to talk about endocrine disruptors, as you're saying, those environmental hormones that mimic estrogens in the body, but to a toxic extent that overstimulate and make us sick. And they're in everything. They're in the, they're in the uh, heavy metals, the lead in our lipstick, the, you know, the, the um, milk in our, the hormones injected into our milk and to our meat, the, um, Oh, so many things, PBAs and parabens and BPAs and all those things, even the shower curtains, the phthalates, the plastic softeners, all of these fra fragrances, things that we inhale that we use on our skin, they are actually converting in our bodies to chemicals that are disrupting our hormone balance. And there's so much unawareness about this, but yet there is a growing awareness because of, of people like us, my girls and me and, and, and ZRT lab and other hormone testing labs out there and educators who are saying, wait a minute, you can test for hormone imbalances. You can find out if you have, you know, first know what your symptoms are, test, and then take action to use natural remedies to avoid the chemicals, to become conscious, conscious of what causes these imbalances. And, you know, there are just so many people that don't get periods, that can't get pregnant, that have seesaw moods that are scaring their children like I did, that can't lose weight, that are you know suffering with PCOS and incredible abdominal weight gain, um, acne, all of these things that are actually um, so often strongly associated with specific hormone imbalances that you can identify through testing. 
So I worked at that lab for 12 years. I've seen thousands of test reports. A lot of what was going on with us was we had people like Suzanne Summers and in honor of her, she died recently, just last week, I think, or two weeks ago. She really put the the hormone testing in bioidenticals, um, the, you know, the, the definition of hormones that are made from plants rather than mm -hmm. synthetic uh, hormones made from Premarin and pregnant mare's urine. Um, she put it on the map and she, I think our business increased threefold overnight. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Suzanne Summers. But that's that was my time. Suzanne Summers, the explosion of integrative medicine and functional medicine, the Women's Health Initiative, that however it has been shown to have had some flaw in the design also did reveal the risks to women of synthetic hormones made from horses we are not horses right um, women are not horses we don't need to be using synthetic hormones at all there are plenty of bioidentical hormones out there that can help so mm -hmm. yeah so that's been kind of the trajectory the learning for myself balancing myself and then becoming an educator at a, a lab that was testing that I mean that lab that I worked for for 12 years as their director of education I am still very tied in with them we still use their testing um, they have tested over 10 million people now all over the world and so the awareness has really grown and it's very gratifying and you know when Jess talks about coming back to me to help. She did so much of the work on her own, but I think the hormone piece was something that, yeah, because I worked in a hormone testing lab and I would come home with these stories every night. They got just fed up with it, but it is pretty fascinating stuff. You can never learn enough. And I talk to so many women now and Jess does too, that are really surprising me with their awareness of what the symptoms of hormone imbalance are with the work they've done to do research, to read the books out there by Alyssa Vitti and Naviva Ram and Sarah Gottfried and so many of the good you know, gurus out there that know so much and are educating us. So I think the world is shifting. I think menopause, the word menopause now is sort of the word du jour everybody's talking about it over here in England. They've got so much going on about menopause. They even have a minister of parliament who's promoting um, some workplace changes for women who are in menopause. Wow. So understanding because there's even a woman here who sued her company because she says they fired her and they didn't realize she had symptoms of menopause. So it's a <laughs> happening thing. And that's the world we inhabit. But one last thing I have to say, because I'm a woman of, you know, a certain age and I am in menopause and, and, and will be until I, until my last breathing day, but the girls were the ones that really said, mom, what about younger women like us? You know, what about the younger gals that are on birth control who haven't had their periods, who have PCOS? Let's talk to them. So they really opened up that that dimension for us. And I think we've helped, a, I, I feel like we've helped a lot of women your age. Don't you think Jess? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Have you tried countless diets, but you're still seeking your nutrition sweet spot? Are you trying to get results on your health journey to feel your best without being too restrictive? Now I know how you feel. I've done the diet thing, but there never was that one that totally worked for me. And this is exactly why I developed the MADE diet. Now, I found that rather than restrictions, it's best to have a set of guidelines that allow you to customize based on your preferences and bio-individuality while staying on track with your health and fitness goals. I found the nutrition sweet spot. And as a health and nutrition expert, I get asked all the time, what? when and how I eat. <laughs> and as someone who's passionate about education and helping others, I want to share that with you. Now, the Made Diet ebook lays it all out for you, taking the guesswork out of dieting. The Made Diet is a lifestyle plan that incorporates moderate protein, adequate fat, decreased carbs, and an introduction to intermittent fasting. The ebook gets right down to business by answering your most frequently asked questions. It includes thoughtfully designed recipes and a seven day sample meal plan to start you off right. It will honestly kickstart your weight loss journey and have you losing inches in your very first week. Now, intermittent fasting combined with these nutritional guidelines is honestly the piece that so many people have been missing when trying to get results. This ebook has all the information you need. 
in a format that is condensed and to the point so that you can get to your results. If you're ready to get started, the Made Diet ebook is available immediately on my website for just $9.99. So head over to melissamadeonline.com forward slash made diet to take action towards feeling your best today. And once you do, oh my gosh, please let me know it's working for you. I am so honored to be a part of your health journey. Okay, back to the show. I want to stick with you real, real fast, Candice, again, because my target market seems to be, you know, lots of 30 year olds, many 40 year olds, and then uh, 40 plus, but the 40 year olds is a really big, big chunk of my audience and who listens to this podcast. And I'm mm -hmm. getting a lot of women that are coming to me asking, um, I think I'm in perimenopause. Uh, you know, I should, you know, should I, is this, you know, they're, they're very confused of what perimenopause is. Uh, and there are obviously symptoms that go along with it. Can you share with the audience what, you know, how do they know if this is just, you know, a mood swing or if this is, you know, a change of life? What, what, what are they looking for to, to really tell them? Like, cause I don't think that this is shared with the doctors, you know, when they go get their, their well women check, they're not saying, okay, when you start to see these symptoms, this means that you're having a change of life. So it just kind of hits them and they're confused on whether or not this is something that is permanent, you know, they will continue to be on this path or if it's just a, a blip. Um, can you share those symptoms? Sure. Um, it is interesting how many women I talk to who are uncertain about whether or not they're in perimenopause, but and I've had people say, I'm suspecting I'm in perimenopause. <laughs> and I think, I think women know, I, I think one of the main um, symptoms would be a change in your period, a change in bleeding patterns. So you know, when a woman says to me, I had periods that were like clockwork mm -hmm. and now they were every 28 days and now they're every 35 days or they're 50 days or they're, or I had missed my period. So lighter cycles, heavier cycles, suddenly you have cramps or pain that you didn't have, um, missing periods that have gone missing, um, longer cycles, shorter cycles. That's your first big clue. And also the age, you know, late, uh, it used to be that women around, you could, you could pretty well know that around 40, 45, um, you were in peri as in nearing menopause, um, because it's an age thing. It's inevitable that at some, at that, at that point in our reproductive lives, the ovaries start to sputter, you know, they start to kind of as I put it, they're starting to pack their bags, but it can kind of take eight to 10 years to get to that place where you're officially in menopause. Mm -hmm. So menopause is much easier to define than perimenopause because it's very definitive. It's 12 sequential months in a row without a period. Mm -hmm. And by the time, and it's usually about by the time you're 50, 51, but perimenopause is less, um, you know, it's less easily defined because women have different symptoms and right. overlapping symptoms. Um, but I think the bleeding changes are one thing and not to panic if you miss a period one month and then it comes back or you're spotting during the month, you, you will begin to know, well, you know, my hormones are beginning to shift and I'm ent entering the transition that mm. is perimenopause, which can take, by the way, eight to 10 years. I started to say, some women in their late 30s, depending on the amount of stress in one's life, and I'm talking about toxic stress, the kind of stress where you feel overwhelmed, where you're not in control, stress is in control of your life, you know, where you don't have, a, you don't have the wherewithal to relax, you don't know how to anymore, you're overbooked, you're overcommitted, you're, uh, you know, you're overtraining, so many obvious um, stressors are you know, things like financial woes and moving and divorce, but less obvious things are too much, you know, too many workouts, um, restricting protein and good fats. And that's my concern with, with the way women eat is that the building blocks of hormones are protein and good fats. So if you restrict those, if you, if you become a strict vegan, um, you better know how to combine your proteins properly and how to add in the fats and the fiber. So anyway, back to perimenopause, 38 to 45 um, is about when it's gonna show up and you're not gonna get out of it, folks. This is the way it goes. 
I mean, there's no getting out of this, but what there is, what you can get out of is a horrible bumpy ride. It doesn't need to be a roller coaster. It doesn't have to be that you're Jekyll and Hyde and scaring your kids and scaring your husband. And, you know, mm -hmm. everybody's like, let's clear out. You know, she's, yeah. it doesn't have to be that way. But I, I think women need help. They usually need, um, you know, they need to improve their diets. They need to, um, you know, balance their blood sugars. Um, they need to lose the toxic fat around their middle. Uh, I know you're into intermittent fasting and sometimes that can be very, very helpful. And for some women, I think it's, it can be a challenge if we're talking about women that have adrenal fatigue and who have been restricting their calories for a long time, who have low estrogen. And those are the, those are the areas where testing can really help us to identify what are your hormone levels? Are you way low in estrogen? So you're at risk of, of losing bone. Are you way high in estrogen so that you're at risk of building inflammatory fat and storing it in the wrong places? Mm -hmm. You know, um, are you low in progesterone, which most women in perimenopause, I should mention, one of the reasons why this ovulation becomes so erratic is that we are not producing progesterone upon ovulation as we get older. We're not ovulating, so we're not producing progesterone. We're not ovulating reliably. As I said, the ovaries are starting to become more erratic and unreliable. So when that happens, we don't make progesterone. And when we don't make progesterone, we don't have the balancing effect that progesterone provides. Progesterone is that, you know, it's estrogen and progesterone that control the menstrual cycle. And um, estrogen grows things. It grew all our female organs and it grows the egg and the ovary and the lining of the endometrium that we shed as a period. But it's progesterone that says, okay, upon ovulation, we don't need more estrogenic activity. We need to calm things down. We need to get the womb ready for a possible pregnancy. If there is no pregnancy, if there is no fertilized egg, progesterone says, okay, let's shed, let's have a period. So progesterone is hugely important for triggering that. If there is a fertilized egg, it's progesterone that sees that embryo happily implanted in the womb and sees that embryo through the first trimester. So these two hormones are like crucial. And that's what starts to shift at perimenopause. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, I mean, there's so much to say about that, but hopefully I kind of answered that question. Along with the bleeding changes come the mood changes too. And the hot flashes, that's another one. That's a big, big symptom. So if you've got bleeding changes, mood changes, hot flashes and or night sweats, I can, and you're nearing 40, you're pretty much going to say, I, I think I'm in menopause. I'm suspecting I'm in menopause, perimenopause, <laughs> perimenopause. Yeah. I, um, so I'll be, I'll be 50, uh, in February and wow, you look great. Oh, well, thank you. I've always had pretty, pretty good, you know, skin. well, well, bless you, uh, menstrual cycles. <laughs> and it's, I I'm now on my fourth month of not having a period and it just, they just stopped. I mean, I didn't, there was no, for me, there was no, you know, erratic changes. It was just a, oh, we're just going to stop. And I remember just a couple of weeks ago, you know, he always asks, you know, you know, why men ask, uh, if, if I'm, you know, the period has come or if it's coming or anything. And I said, no, you know, cause I, I wear an aura ring and it's, I track it. It's been like 140 days now since I've had one. And he's like, He's like, is this perimenopause? He says, because I've heard frightening things about it. And he goes, you're pretty even keel. And I'm like, number one, yes, you're very lucky. I said, number two, I do attest it to, you know, a very healthy diet. And I, I never was on birth control. I, you know, I do, I'm just very conscious of, of my health. And, um, I do think that plays obviously a very big role, which I know both of you would attest to. And Jess, yeah. I, want, I wanted to ask you, um, because your mom had mentioned, uh, birth control and 52%. That's, that's mind boggling. I didn't know it was that high of women being on birth control. Uh, you mentioned, um, fertility awareness method that for women that, you know, cause so many women, they know the birth control, especially if they're not on it for the right reasons, um, know that it's disrupting, uh, the, the hormones. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? I found that very fa fascinating of ways that you can be conscious of not getting pregnant without having those, having to take that birth control. Right. Yeah. I mean, I myself was on birth control for a lot of years, um, even though, you know, my mom did encourage me to find other means, but I will say at the time, 
the fertility awareness method wasn't something that was really widely talked about. It, I feel like now, especially with social media, people, there's a lot more fertility awareness educators. There's a lot more people talking about transitioning off hormonal birth control and how to do it in a healthy way, which by the way, it's really important if you can to take a few months to transition off of birth control versus going off of it cold turkey because the birth control pill depletes key yeah. minerals like magnesium, vitamin C, selenium, the B vitamins, which all play an integral role in ovulation and hormone balance. So optimally, if you can, you would start by re-upping those crucial vitamins and minerals before you come off of it. Um, you would prioritize your nutrition, your self-care movement, different things like that, and then come off so that you don't have this resurgence of symptoms mm -hmm. that you potentially went on the pill to mitigate because essentially those synthetic hormones are just, um, kind of acting like a band-aid approach and numbing your symptoms, but they're still festering under the surface so that when you come off the pill and your hormones sort of wake back up and that communication starts back with your, between your brain and ovaries, then things can start to go out of balance and start, you know, things can start to happen. Acne can come back periods regulate, but then they're painful again. But if you can have that transition, that would be optimal. And then a lot of what women are concerned about is, okay, but if I don't want to get pregnant, what do I do? And unfortunately, the options are limited. There's the copper IUD, which is non-hormonal, but a lot of women experience a lot of pain upon insertion, um, really heavy bleeding. Um, it wor works for some, but I have heard a lot of not so great stories. Um, there is a gel now called Fexi, but it's uh, there's some controversy around how well it actually works. So the fertility awareness method, more specifically, the symptothermal method, includes multiple, um, uh, basically it's user dependent. So that's the hardest thing about it is you really have to be diligent about it. Um, but it includes symptom tracking. So tracking your cycle length, um, and then tracking your symptoms. So, um, ideally you would, I, I love an app. Some people will use the calendar method, but I think apps technology now just make it a lot easier. There's a great app called 28. Um, hmm which uh, Alisa Video also has the MyFlow app. I actually prefer 28, um, but it allows you to track your cycle. They now have a feature where you can input symptoms. So when you approach like ovulation or the luteal phase, your premenstrual week, you can put in things that you notice. Maybe you notice every week before you get your period, you're having really bad headaches or fatigue or you're starving or you're having really bad bloating or breakouts. You can mark these symptoms. Um, to kind of start to formulate, to connect the dots. So marking symptoms is important, but the most important factors of the fertility awareness method is basal body temperature tracking. So taking your basal body temperature every morning and tracking that because essentially after ovulation, your temperature increases by about 0.5 to one degree. And after you about four days of high temperature days, you can pretty much safely confirm that you have ovulated and that you've moved into the luteal phase where you're no longer fertile. And the best way of doing that is using an app like Natural Cycles, which comes with a thermometer. Um, but then there's also a great partnership between Aura Ring and Natural Cycles now, and I have an Aura Ring too. And that's what I use now where it takes your um, temperature every day and it uh, feeds it into the natural cycles algorithm. So it'll take your temperature and then after it has, I believe it's four high temperature days, it'll confirm that you've ovulated. Um, and it's a little bit more accurate than using the thermometer because the thermometer you have to keep in mind is pretty, temperature is finicky. So if you get up to go to the bathroom in the night, if you've had alcohol the night before, if you traveled or you were sick, it can impact your temperature, which is also why you want at least four days of high temperature days just to make sure that it's actually accurate. Um, but then you know, okay, I'm not fertile anymore. Um, and then the other uh, part of it is tracking cervical fluid. Um, and that basically changes throughout the month. The most important thing to know is that as you start to approach ovulation, it becomes uh, creamier, kind of like hand lotion. And the closest that you are, your peak fertile phase 
um, it'll start to get more clear and abundant and stretchy. And I know some people are grossed out by this, but I feel like I talk about it so much. It's just normal to me now. You could actually uh, like put it between your fingers and stretch it. And mm -hmm. if you are grossed out by it, I promise after you do it for a couple of weeks, um, it actually becomes very interesting. And, um, you know, there's a couple different ways you can track it, but you can wipe before you go pee and look at the toilet paper and see the changes. And if you see that peak fertile fluid, or some people call it mucus, um, I don't know why the word mucus just really grosses me out. So I say, fluid. It makes like, me no. mucus, you're sick, right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but <laughs> yeah, it'll change. And then that's your sign of, okay, I'm very fertile right now. Uh, if I'm trying not to get pregnant, then I really need to abstain. And mm -hmm. then the rise in temperature will tell you I have ovulated. So it's two different markers, right? The, the, uh, the fertile mucus is telling, uh, fluid is telling you that it's approaching and the temperature is telling you that it's already happened. So if you can do this consistently, I would say, use a barrier method like non-toxic condoms while you're learning the method because it takes a while to learn it but mm -hmm. after you've learned the method you know two months maybe using a barrier method and you've got it down and you know your aura ring or natural cycles or daisy is another one temp drops another one um has the algorithm right then it can be up to 99.6 percent effective wow. so it is super super effective when used correctly but I say correctly because it's user dependent. So you want to give yourself that time or find a fertility awareness educator to help guide you through it. But it's what I've been using for years now and have not gotten pregnant. So um, it's very effective. There's a lot of educators out speaking about it. We have a blog post. If you go to yourhormonebalance.com and type in fertility awareness method that goes even deeper into it. But I love it. And you don't have the circulating hormones in your body. I love knowing this because, you know, it's, I would love for my clients to be off of horm, uh, birth control if, if they don't need it for the reason it's intended, but it's having that plan <laughs> outside of it, of, of you know, the, to have an answer of what you could do instead. So I appreciate that. I'll, I'm going to definitely use that blog. And Jess, will you, uh, we talked about with your mom, perimenopause and menopause, uh, you being a woman of reproductive years, uh, talk about uh, how kind of optimizing our cycles and, um, what people can do to feel more confident in, uh, the little changes that they need to make with each cycle of their period to remain someone other people want to live with. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, we would have to have a whole nother podcast to really dive into the cycle syncing method. So I won't go into like the huge description I would normally give, but, um, I think as a woman, as someone with a menstrual cycle, it is extremely important to understand the ebbs and flows of your hormones and what's happening, what's changing. Um, I actually just spoke with a friend who was like, I have no idea. Like when I ovulate really, she's like, I don't really know about the four phases. She wants to learn more mm -hmm. and she's so cute. She's like listening to our podcast now and stuff and trying to educate herself, but she's not alone. There's so many women that don't know when they ovulate that don't understand that there's four unique phases of the menstrual cycle. And, you know, one of the reasons to understand and get connected with our menstrual cycle is because it helps you to better connect with your body and understand your cyclical nature and how your hormones fluctuate and change throughout the month, which can lend itself to different moods, different cravings, different, um, honestly, social habits. So there are four unique phases of every menstrual cycle. There's the menstrual phase, which every woman is familiar with because we bleed during that phase. Um, there is the follicular phase, which starts the day after your period ends. There is the ovulatory phase, which is about five to six days long. And that is the only phase where we are actually fertile, um, that we can actually get pregnant. And the reason why it's six up to six days is because there is the one day of ovulation, but then there's up to five days that sperm can survive inside of us via that peak cervical fluid that I was talking about. And so I have gotten like, not, I, I'm going to say backlash, but not really like some comments on some posts that have said, like, that's not true. I got pregnant when I had sex on my period. So 
that's not true. And it's like, that can happen. It's very rare, but it would happen if you had a very short follicular phase. And let's say you had sex on day five of your period and then sperm survives inside of you for five to six days. And then you ovulate and you yeah. you're still in the ovulation phase. So sure. yes, that happens for some women, but just to clarify, you can only get pregnant during the ovulatory phase. Um, so it's, it's great to know that because so many of us grew up being taught that we could get pregnant just by looking at someone, not literally, but any day yeah. of that. And so it gives you that power and knowing. And then after that, after you ovulate and you get that temperature rise, you go into the luteal phase, which I like to break into early luteal and late luteal because it's the longest phase and the late luteal encompasses the premenstrual week, which also unfortunately encompasses PMS for a lot of women. But it's important to know that bad PMS is common, but it's not normal. So if you have really bad cramping, uh, really bad bloating, cystic acne, migraines, um, you know, super low uh, energy that is again, common, not normal. That's a sign that you're dealing with the hormonal imbalance that needs to be addressed and utilizing the cycle syncing method where you actually start to kind of tweak your nutrition, your exercise and your lifestyle habits with the four unique phases can actually really help to improve hormonal symptoms and PMS. So just a couple of things to note really quick without getting into like each of the phases and how to support, but it is helpful to know that during the first part of the menstrual cycle, um, during that follicular phase and during the ovulatory phase, um, you, your resting cortisol stress hormone levels are naturally lower. So your body is more resilient to stress. Mm -hmm. And so these are good phases. Your body can handle a little bit more high intensity exercise. For example, it can handle maybe longer fasting windows. It can handle, um, maybe I'm not saying restriction ever, but let's say that you're, you are wanting to lose weight during these phases. If you wanted to do like a cleanse or something like that, your body would be able to better handle it. Um, traveling, your body can bounce back faster from time zone changes. And so it's not to say, okay, let me just stay up all night, travel, not eat anything. No, you still need to be very aware and have balance, but your body is more, more resilient to stress. So on top of it, your metabolism is actually slightly slower. So it is actually a good time to maybe schedule in one to two days of HIIT training. If energetically you can handle it, you also have to listen to your body, keeping it at about around 20 minutes, complementing it with restorative movement and some strength training. Um, you could be trying, you know, being in a calorie deficit and be more successful in that deficit during this phase, you could handle a little bit more caffeine and maybe it, you don't get that same like 3 PM crash. So I don't drink coffee personally, but for those who do it's, you know, during these phases, it, you might actually do really well with it. I always say, try to pair coffee with a balanced meal instead of on an empty stomach when possible. Um, but then in the luteal phase, your body, your resting cortisol levels are higher. So your body is less resilient to stress. So you could do that same HIIT training workout and be extremely fatigued. You could have that same coffee and have a 3 PM crash. You could be in a calorie deficit and super hungry and you don't understand why your metabolism also increases because progesterone is a thermogenic hormone. So you're naturally a little bit hungrier. And a lot of women blame themselves for that. They're like, God, why am I so hungry before my period? But it yeah. helps you understand and have compassion for yourself. Like, oh, actually maybe now is not the time for a really extreme calorie deficit. Maybe I should focus on being in maintenance during the luteal phase and focus on building strength, maybe switching my coffee to something a little less caffeinated, like even a chai or turmeric latte, um, doing more stretching and yoga, dialing back on the intensity of workouts, maybe not being as social, you know, doing too many social events, um, traveling too much, that kind of thing. So these little tweaks and changes really allow you to better understand your body, work with your physiology. And then of course, always tune in and listen to your body. Cause there's no one set of rules that applies to everyone. Yeah. I love that. And I think it, it, it always starts with just get a journal and, and journal. I mean, everything from 
you know, what you're eating, how your food makes you feel when you're pooping, what your poop looks like. You talked about, you know, uh, the mucus looking at it. You got to look at your poop too uh, and journal your moods. Uh, and when you're on your period or when you're experiencing perimenopause to just write down these things. And so you really have something to go off of if you're just constantly trying to go off memory and, and improve mood or improve hormone health or to lose weight, it's really, really difficult, but to, to actually put all of that down into writing and to give yourself time and patience to, to analyze it or have someone uh, like you guys or myself look at it and go, okay, you know, we're seeing patterns here. Uh, I think is, is a very, if, if you if by any means feel overwhelmed by all the information, just start journaling and putting down into pen to paper, how you're feeling and how your body's reacting to how you're living, I think is a huge thing. Candice, I have, um, I have a fun question for you, ma'am. Um, do you and your daughters ever disagree? Uh, well, I'm, yeah, I think, I think we always have to determine like for our business, um, with your home unbalance, we have to determine our stance on various things, you know? Mm -hmm. So how do we feel about birth control? I remember that was a big one just trying to decide, uh, you know, they had been on birth control, they had used birth control. I used birth control. I was the first in line back in the sixties, but where <laughs> are we with that now? You know, yeah. what sort of foods can we, um, can we recommend and what can we not? We go back and forth over certain supplements, um, you know, but in terms of our personal, I, I don't know that we, I, I don't know. We don't, <laughs> Do we disagree very much, Jess? I don't know. We're pretty much on the same page these days. I think but we, we discuss. Very, we don't disagree. We discuss. Yeah, I was going to say, we've always been a very analytical family. We always uh, analyze everything, um, maybe overanalyze. And yeah. we like to talk a lot, maybe too much as well. But we... Um, but we're a very vocal family and I think it's one of our strengths. We always talk through everything. And so sure we've had fighting in our family, but it's been, I think more my sister and mom have had, have had disagreements and fights because they are very, both very opinionated and very strong personalities. And my dad and I are a little bit more like, oh. uh, like controversy as much. So we're like the mediators that come in and try to, you know, problem solve. But I think, yeah, for sure. We've had moments of heat, but I think that we do a really good job. Just, you know, maybe we're upset with each other for a little bit, but we always talk through it and we always come back together. I, sh I should say though, um, I think one of, um, when you're a parent of teenagers, that is probably the more likely time when there are disagreements and there were more disagreements and it back to the beginning of this, when Jess said, you know, that I pointed out to her that she had gained so much weight in such a short period of time, she was angry and upset at herself, but it was, she could segue and be angry at me for having said it out loud. And I think that was useful and helpful <laughs> in a way, but I mean, my God, if I'd known you were on birth control pills, if I'd known you were, on, I mean, if I'd known you were on um, diet pills, there would have been some disagreements. If I had known you, you know, there are certain things we, we moms don't know. And, and I think um, we've been talking about doing a mom and daughter course. Um, there's a great book out there called the teenage hormone takeover. It's a, it's a handbook for, for moms actually to survive that because, you know, we go remember those little girls that we hold in our arms when they're little and they just want to be with mommy and follow us around and everything's wonderful. And then, then by the time they're 13, they're kind of slamming the door in your face and don't want to hear from you. And, or, and, you know, that we all go through that period, but it's really, it can be very upsetting for us mothers to understand what's going on hormonally and why they're taking exception to every single thing we say. You know, it's like when you go shop, I remember when we started going shopping together as you guys got older and nothing that I, oh, isn't this great? This is just you. No, it isn't. I hate that. You know, that sort of thing. Um, 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. So I think when we say, no, we don't disagree, that's now. I think before, during the teen years, there were probably a lot more disagreements. I remember sending Jesse to her room you are not going to school wearing that, you know, <laughs> such and such. Yeah, That's little did you know, I packed it in my bag and wore it anyway. No. <laughs> okay, oh, probably. Yeah. Probably. I went to the locker room and put makeup on sometimes. Yep. 
Every yeah. teenage girl. Yep. That's for sure. So I want, and I don't know which one of you would be better to answer this or if you want to both share for me, uh, this is kind of a personal question. I, I don't know that my mom listens to my podcast. Um, if she does, I will know for sure now that she does, because she's going to come at me for this, but my mom, like I said, I'll be 50 in February. She'll be uh, 70 in February and very set in her ways. And uh, you know, grew so did I, but she, you know, grew up in the, the low fat era, um, still just very confused, even though she knows how educated her daughter is. And my stepdad, uh, who's 79, you know, uh, uh, very, very type two diabetic just had, you know, open heart surgery, not too long ago, oh. uh, the way that she feeds him and the way that I would feed him are completely different. And so I know Candace that you went to Jess and, and, you know, shared your, and I tried to do that with my mom but it's, it's difficult. Uh, she, she, she gets defensive and it's hard for her to hear, but we're, you know, we're talking about, you know, how th this is the most important stage of their life, taking care of themselves. And there's a little bit of pushback. Um, any advice on how I can go about helping them, uh, without hurting them? Ah, uh, well, I think I know, um, with my own mom, when she was much older, she, my mother was actually a model back in the forties and she mm -hmm. was on diets the whole time I was growing up. Um, she was always super thin and never eating. She wasn't a good cook. And in her older years, she started gaining weight. And at one point she was up to 200 pounds and she had a huge belly, lots of abdominal fat, and she just hated herself. And so, you know, hopefully it doesn't get to that point, but when your parents have symptoms that you can identify and that maybe they complain about, you, you, that's a teachable moment where you can say, you know, that is probably very likely due to this. And just by making these changes, mm -hmm. um, you could, you could probably feel better or just comments like, you know, mom, maybe you don't remember how good you used to feel. There are things that we can do now so that you can start feeling better because you get used to the way, you know, to your symptoms and to not feeling top of your game, but we can, you can get back to that. Um, Jess and, and Ryan were just visiting us in England and Jess made out a whole diet plan for her dad and me. Dad has a belly. I don't eat enough protein in the morning. I have gotten to the place where I, I actually do some intermittent fasting. I don't eat till about 11 and I have found that it's helped to control. I mean, it has helped me stay slimmer uh, through the abdominal area, but I think it's also, um, I sometimes go too long or I don't think about when I do break the fast when, which is only until 11 o'clock, but I generally don't eat enough protein. She's right. I would toast, make a piece of toast and put butter and jam on it. A low sugar jam, of course. And <laughs> my cup of tea. And this is a big admission. Don't do as I've been doing. I but promise you. <laughs> Jess really, I mean, she really t has taken me to task. And I would like to say that I now have my piece of toast, which of course is whole grain or sourdough or something flatbread, something pretty healthy. High grains are important, as we know. High fiber is hugely important to cut that intake of that that spike of sugar and mm -hmm. to help control insulin, um, which is such a big issue, insulin resistance and prediabetes in people that are, you know, aging. Um, so now the toast has had this morning had an avocado. It had a hard boiled egg wow. and a little slice of some nice cheese. And then I had a little piece of toast with my jam on it. <laughs> Compromise. <laughs> have it on yeah, but I mean, it just be, you know, and I don't think when just, just at first I have to say, I was a little bit annoyed. It's like, these are my habits. Leave me alone. That's my um, mom. That's but, my mom. But, but Jess has become, you know, I have to respect her and I do respect her. She's, you know, way ahead of me on the nutrition front, but I did the same with my mom. I made a plan for her that I told her would help her feel better. She was constantly going on about her weight. I said, okay, well, let's deal with it. She lost 20 pounds mm -hmm. by, we, you know, by watching her fats, her um, sugars and the high glycemic yeah. foods. 
you know, being aware, that's a really interesting, fascinating thing, being aware of glycemic load, you, what foods actually cause, you know, your sugar to spike and insulin to spike. And there are so many interesting foods that you would think would be fine, but aren't. And other foods that, you know, rice and beans can be high in glycemic, but there are different kinds of rice, there are different kinds of melons. I think that's a really important thing to educate yourself about. But somehow find a, a place where she's interested in feeling better on some level and then also, with it. I, I also that. think that it's important to, no matter the age of the person, if they're your family member or what, but to meet people where they're at. And I think restriction is where people are going to turn away, where they have to feel like they have to overhaul their habits overnight and they have yeah. to just change everything they love. So my approach with my mom was not, you can't have toast in the morning. It was more the suggestion of have your toast, have your jam, but can you do like a scoop of protein in your coffee, um, mix it up, make oh. a protein latte and sip that before you have your toast and then have your toast. And also that tastes delicious. It's not like, oh, I have to have this protein latte. Tastes yeah. really good. I mean, the eggs, adding that and the cheese, that's great too, but just not saying we're going to take this thing that you love away. We're just going to tweak it a little bit. We're going to amp it up a little bit. We're going to allow it to support you while still giving you that thing that you love. You know, it's yeah. kind of playing with it too, because no, I'm not having an egg and, and avocado every morning. I, some mornings have oats and I'm, but I'm putting protein, a scoop of protein powder in my oats now. Yeah. Jesse has, makes these wonderful latte mixes and I created a, she created a recipe for overnight oats with her pumpkin latte mix and protein powder and cinnamon and some other stuff. Mm -hmm. Wow. Is that good? This is really you good. Know, yeah. and yogurt yeah. and that. So there's plenty of ways it's that it can be fun too. Right. So. Yeah. You know, stalking you like I did, uh, just, you have, uh, really great recipes on your social media. I was, um, really impressed with some of those and, and I'm anxious to try myself. Uh, so for you guys, definitely, which will lead me to, to closing this out. Uh, I would love for you ladies to share, um, where my audience can find you, uh, the different avenues. And if they uh, want to work with you a little bit more about your hormone testing that you do, I uh, just share with them all that's available to them, uh, after hearing you and I'm sure falling in love with you because I really, truly enjoyed this, this interview, <laughs> having, having both of you on, um, it's, it's been really fun. <laughs> As been funny. We just missed your daughter. So we'll have to do it again. I know. I know. Wait, I'll, I'll go first just because I'm uh, so into the hormone testing and we are in the saliva testing camp, which I still really like. There's some great testing out there, dried urine and other kinds of testing. But I think saliva stands first and foremost as the gold standard of testing stress hormone levels because we do want to see that diurnal curve is cortisol where it should be in the morning, noon, evening, night. It travels along that circadian rhythm and we can only, you can't be sticking a needle in your arm four times a day to track your adrenal function. Um, and blood tests are, you know, they don't look at active bioavailable hormone levels. We want to, we want to measure hormones in saliva because we're looking at hormones that have left the bloodstream, that fraction that has gotten a signal from the pituitary that, Hey, she's working out. We need a little testosterone over here. So we're, yeah. we're tracking these hormones as they move into tissue, salivary gland tissue. And we are picking up on the levels that are actually at work in the target cells of the body. So that tells you a whole lot more about what's going on and helps us identify this is estrogen is low or high progesterone is lower. You know, what's the rate ratio between them, testosterone, DHEA, and your cortisols. It's a world of information. We take a goodly amount of time to discuss it. If you consult with me, you talk, we talk for 45 minutes, sometimes more um, about what the levels mean. We've got our test results in front of us. They usually take five to seven days after people send in their sample, collect saliva four times in the core over the course of one day, but at a particular point in the cycle for cycling women, it has to be specific window when you collect days 19, 20, 21, um, when we're, we're bridging that part of the cycle that is going to give us the optimal hormone picture. Mm -hmm. um, for for non-cycling women like me and menopause, you can test any time, but these things make a huge difference. 
we get the results back, we go through them. And I'm sort of the one that can, for those who want to talk about what does all this mean? Our test result has a lovely comment field that is, as I was mentioning, Dr. Zava, my mentor, it's his brain on the page. It's full of education and information. But for a lot of people, it's like, help me understand better. So we discuss it. And we also, <clears throat> I think, are great listeners, both Jess and I. And that's a huge part of this whole thing. Women need to talk. Women are missing out on that part mm -hmm. of this. They need to feel listened to. I am so sad that I still hear women say they go to the doctor and they are dismissed they are told that, you know, this is just the way it is. Hey, get used to it. Here's an antidepressant. Hey, do you want to go back on a birth control pill? Um, this is just the way life goes, you know, or it's all in your head. It really amazes me how many women tell me that's still going on. Obviously, mm -hmm. there are lots of doctors out there that would never do that anymore. I have a great interview coming out on my podcast, Women Talking Frankly, with a, a doctor who is just so aware and so taking good care of her patients. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to many people, but still women need to be heard. And um, that's what we do best. And then Jess can tell what she does, but she is really, she is the, she is the person that puts it all together. I'm educating about the results and what they mean and what your hormones do. And Jess is helping you move on. It's like, mm -hmm. anybody's going to say, so, okay, that's cool. You told me all this. What do I do now? <laughs> and that's great. Yeah. yeah, basically, if you are interested in getting your hormones tested with us, you can go to yourhormonebalance.com and um, we have a symptom quiz there that you can take just to kind of see if your symptoms could relate to a hormonal imbalance and it comes with a lot of free resources. Um, we actually made a code for your listeners, Melissa50, if they're interested in getting tested for $50 off any of our testing oh, wow. and testing packages. Thank um, you. But yeah, you'll see the options on there. Um, you can get the essentials package. You can add on a custom rebalancing guide, which really does a deep dive and gives yeah. you a very customized ebook for next steps, which you don't get with a lot of testing out there. Um, and then you could add on a consultation with either myself or my mom. And then if interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching, if you feel like you need support all the time, you can go to bodyblissbyjess.net and apply for a free discovery call with me just to learn more about how I work one-on-one -on -one with clients, which is very customized. And then um, we're at Your Home and Balance on Instagram and Body Bliss by Jess on Instagram. And we would love to connect with you and your listeners. Yeah. I so appreciate that. And, you know, I right now my daughter is, uh, Candice, like your mom, my daughter is in the modeling world and she's uh, really, she still does her nu nutritional work, but she's really focused on modeling right now. But Mm -hmm. What a, what a wonderful vision for me to, you know, maybe one day in the near future for us to be able to work together. If, if we could, I think we could. Yeah. <laughs> I think we could. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would, um, I, I, I love, I love what you have going and, um, and I really appreciate you, uh, not only educating my listeners, um, and having fun with them, but also giving that code that's huge. And, um, I'm well worth the wait, Candice. Um, uh, <laughs> right. a little bit yeah. We had we had time zone issues. She's in the UK yeah. right now, so um, but it well worth the wait. And thank you, ladies, so much for giving the audience um, such a wealth of information when it comes to women, all the way from being a teenager to uh, going through menopause. It's been it's been quite the journey, and I appreciate it. We appreciate oh, you so much welcome. patience and having us on and we love what you're doing in the space too. So thank you. And asking such great questions. Yes. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm yeah. just love what you got going on. I'm telling you. And yeah. as always, my audience, I hope that you wake up feeling prepared and that you go to bed feeling proud. Have a great day, everybody. Wow. We've reached the end, but before I leave you, I'd love to hear from you. After all, it's not every day that someone reaches out and asks for your opinion. And to me, your opinion does matter. So please share this episode with anyone that you think needs to hear this message. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. My name is Melissa McAllister. And until next time, thank you for being your own health advocate.